everyone. Today's video is on bariatric surgeries. Uh, there's really only two types of bariatric surgery that are commonly practiced uh, today, at least in the United States. And while you can easily look up information on these surgeries, uh, they can be a little bit complex to understand when you're just looking at diagrams and there's a bunch of different types of GI anastomoses to keep track of. Uh, and there's also a lot of terminology that I think can be unclear and, you know, a bunch of different terms for talking about the same things that can be difficult to keep straight. So this video will be really about trying to describe uh, the two types of bariatric surgery in their most uh, simple terms and hopefully clear some of that up. So to start, just briefly, I wanted to mention the indications for bariatric surgery, at least according to the ASMBS. Uh, your two indications would be a BMI greater than 40 or a little bit lower BMI, 35 or greater, uh, but with an obesity-related comorbidity. And there's, of course, a lot of comorbidities that are related to obesity, like hypertension, hyperlipidemia, sleep apnea, and then uh, even some you might not think of, such as osteoarthritis from all the extra weight bearing down on the joints, uh, fatty liver disease, and of course, heart disease. And uh, some of the benefits of bariatric surgery are not only treating the obesity and helping the BMI decrease, but a lot of these uh, comorbidities can either improve or actually completely resolve after gastric surgery. So especially in America's current population, you can imagine that this is a really important uh, medical intervention. And so when we think about bariatric surgeries, they can either be restrictive or malabsorptive. And what that means is restrictive is literally just kind of a physical space or volume thing. So you're just um, decreasing essentially the size of the GI tract. And because you've decreased the size, you're decreasing the amount of food that somebody can take in at a time. Whereas malabsorptive uh, means that you're actually bypassing parts of the GI tract that would absorb some of those nutrients. So you are um, impeding the body's ability to absorb the food that's eating, even if it's eating the same amount of food. And so these procedures can be either restrictive or malabsorptive or a combination of the two. And so to finally get into the two surgeries, we have uh, what's kind of colloquially known as the sleeve um, and then the, the bypass. And once again, we're getting into terminology here. So a sleeve, you might also see written as a VSG or vertical sleeve gastrectomy. Uh, it can also just be called a gastric sleeve uh, or a sleeve. Those are all the same thing. Then when it comes to a bypass, you're thinking of the RU-NY, commonly abbreviated R-N-Y, or you can spell it out, R-O-U-G-H. I believe that's a French word, RU-N-Y. Um, gastric bypass or just bypass. Once again, all the same things. Just you got to keep that straight. And so to start, we'll talk about the gastric sleeve. This is a simpler procedure, um, so it's going to be a little bit easier for me to draw out, and then we can work more complex from here. So the sleeve is a restrictive procedure only. So remember, we had our two types. We had our restrictive and our malabsorptive. So this is just restrictive. And how it works is it really just takes place at the stomach. So this is the stomach. Uh, if you also recall, called a vertical sleeve gastrectomy. So we essentially make a vertical gastrectomy, kind of like this, and take off this area or the greater curvature of the stomach. And we're left with a stomach that's kind of described as banana shaped. And so you can imagine that the amount of space that food has uh, to accumulate in the stomach is much, is much smaller. And that's really all there is to it. Just that one staple line. Um, and because of this, you can imagine uh, that it's a little bit less complex of a surgery. So there's relatively few uh, immediate complications. Usually you can either bleed or leak from the staple line kind of along the, the greater curve. Uh, but long-term complications you can think about if you make this remnant too narrow, maybe you cut more like this. If this area scars down, you can get a stricture uh, where you'll have hard time uh, passing oral intake through. Uh, and for whatever reason, this type of stomach remnant actually tends to worsen reflux, whether the gastrectomy causes something with a natural anatomic barrier at the lower esophageal sphincter. I don't know that that's terribly well understood, but uh, something to remember, sleeves actually tend to worsen reflux. And so our other procedure 
remember that's the Roux and Y gastric bypass. This one is both restrictive, but it's also malabsorptive. I'm going to draw a little bit here, um, but this is going to be pretty hard for me to draw out. And we'll get it to a more formal diagram in just a moment. So once again, we have our stomach. And down here, we'll have a looping duodenum transisting into the jejunum. I'll just dry out a few loops of jejunum coming down here. There we go. So the restrictive part happens in the stomach and that's where there's a gastrectomy, but this time it's more in this direction. So there's just a little bit of pouch up here. And then you make another cut down, you measure maybe 50 centimeters down uh, the duodenum and you make an incision in the jejunum. And actually this part of the jejunum right here comes all the way up to this pouch and attaches. And then you can imagine that this blind limb on the other side has to go somewhere. That's going to get plugged in farther down the jejunum. And so I'm sure that's a little bit hard to see in this picture. So we're going to go to a more formal diagram. So as you can see, this is that initial gastrectomy. That's going to leave you with two parts of the stomach, which both stay in in this case. There's no stomach resection the way there was in the sleeve. Up here, we have our gastric pouch. Here we have, they've labeled it as the excluded stomach. This is also frequently called the remnant stomach. Once again, I just want to kind of expose you guys to all this terminology because people will use it interchangeably. And then, like I talked about down here, uh, you measure quite a bit down the jejunum. You make an incision here and you bring this aspect of the genome up and you plug it into the gastric pouch. And that is called your Roux limb and what the procedure is named after. And remember the other end of that, it's kind of hanging out down here and that gets plugged back into the jejunum as well. And that whole limb is gonna be called your biliopancreatic limb coming from your remnant stomach down and plugging into the jejunum. It's also called frequently the BP limb. And then where both of those come together, that's, called the common channel. So you can imagine you have two separate streams where those come together after that is called the common channel. So that's a little bit noisy, uh, a lot to go over at once. So I just wanted to, to review. We start up here, kind of how this fluid flow comes down the esophagus into the gastric pouch. Remember this is the restrictive part of the procedure. So only a small amount of food can actually go into that gastric pouch. And then the food enters uh, through this anastomosis, which is going to be your GJ anastomosis for gastrojejunostomy. It's going to come down this jejunum, this roux limb, until it dumps into the common channel right here, which happens at this anastomosis, which is going to be called your JJ or jejunostomy. And remember, you still have that remnant stomach. It stays in. That feeds down through this limb called the BP limb. And that's also going to plug in at that jejun jejunostomy uh, and feed into the common channel. Uh, another detail, this roux limb you might hear called anticholic or retrocholic. I think more people do anticholic nowadays, but all that means is relative to the colon. You can see the colon kind of faded out back here. And if you're bringing this part of the intestines up, you can either bring it in front of this colon or in the anticholic position or behind the colon in the retrocolic position. And to go behind the colon, you actually have to make a hole in the transverse colon mesentery and then put the small bowel through that. Uh, like I said, I think most people do anticholic now. Uh, that does leave one less space for herniation to happen post-op. And it's a little bit more, I guess, natural because you don't have to make that additional hole in the mesentery. So we've gone through a lot of labels here and as you can imagine, this is a more complex procedure than the sleeve gastrectomy. And so while the you might expect the restrictive and the malabsorptive components, once again, malabsorptive because the nutrients bypass this entire part of the intestine. So no, none, absorption, none of the nutrients can be absorbed in the stomach or the duodenum or proximal jejunum. Uh, but while you might expect that to lead to a little bit better weight loss, uh, you can also expect that a procedure that's this complex is also at a little bit higher risk of complications, both in the short term and the long term. And so you can imagine you can have dumping syndromes through the GJ, uh, where your nutrients flow too quickly into the intestines and either lead to osmotic fluid shifts 
or just a rapid release of insulin and potentially hypoglycemia. Uh, there's risk of afferent limb syndromes up in the biliopancreatic limb where you either have stasis or potentially obstruction that can be issues. Uh, when you plug in the jejunum directly to the stomach, uh, you can get marginal ulcers because the jejunum is not used to handling that acid load of the stomach. And as you can imagine, uh, it becomes very difficult to do an ERCP in someone after they have a gastric bypass. So you can imagine you can't really thread a scope all the way down here and then back up to get to the uh, papilla. So that's a limitation to keep in mind. So now we've talked a little bit about both procedures. You might be thinking about, well, how do we choose one versus the other? And so I just wanted to draw out a quick table here. So you've got your sleeve and then your RU and Y. And the reason we have both of these is there's no clear winner between the two. So let's start with short-term outcomes up here with an S. Uh, so the RU and Y has typically more short-term weight loss. So that's a plus, but it also has more short-term complications. So that is a negative. And then if we look long term, you can see that the outcomes are actually fairly similar as far as weight loss goes. Ruin wise is still a little bit better, uh, but it's not as big of an increase as there is in the short term outcomes. Uh, and also, so a little bit better for weight loss and also probably a little bit better with the comorbidity resolution. So Ruin Y probably wins a little bit in the long-term outcomes, but remember it also has these other risks of more complications with your marginal ulcers, your various types of herniations or obstructions that can happen. Uh, so there are some downsides to it as well. Uh, a big differentiating factor can actually be GERD. So remember, like we talked about a sleeve gastrectomy, will worsen GERD. So if somebody has bad GERD, you don't want to give them a sleeve gastrectomy. Well, a RUIN Y will actually cure it because it uh, separates the kind of acid producing part of the stomach from the esophagus. And the other thing to consider if somebody has really bad GERD and they have something like Barrett's esophagus, you definitely want to do a RUIN Y as opposed to a sleeve. One, to treat the Barrett's by treating the reflux, uh, but also if somebody would ever require an esophagectomy down the road, if they've had a gastrectomy, they're not going to be able to get your typical gastric conduit for that procedure. So in a lot of situations, they're fairly similar. A sleeve is a little bit simpler, uh, but probably doesn't have uh, as much weight loss or comorbidity resolution. The Rune Y has better comorbidity resolution and weight loss, at least slightly in the long term, uh, but does have more risk of complications. Uh, and finally, uh, if somebody has GERD, that does make your choice pretty clear in favor of the Rune Y gastric bypass. And then finally, just a few quick pearls for these patients post-op. Um, you want to, anytime somebody loses a lot of weight, you got to worry about the risk of gallstone formation. So some people will give um, ursodeoxycholic acid to help prevent gallstones. Uh, and then when you think about Rue and Y patients, remember they should not be on NSAIDs because of that risk of marginal ulcers where the jejunum plugs into the stomach. Uh, and they also are not going to be able to get an ERCP if they would have problems with those gallstones that can form post-op uh, that we just talked about. And then finally, I did want to touch on the fact that if somebody has a Ruin Y, um, really anybody with a small bowel obstruction, that's a big deal. But a Ruin Y, you've really got to worry about small bowel obstructions being closed loop. Actually, if you go back a few slides. So first of all, if they have an obstruction maybe at the JJ and you're backing up uh, into your remnant, there's no outlet here, right? Like you can't throw up what's in that remnant stomach. So that is functionally a closed loop obstruction. And then anytime you cut the mesentery, like you do for your JJ, you do to bring up your root limb, those uh, place gaps in the mesentery where bowel can actually herniate to and either volvulize or um, essentially cut off the blood supply to a large portion of the small intestine, which is of course uh, very severe. So anytime you have somebody with especially a Ruin Y anatomy and a small bowel obstruction, those people almost always go to early surgery because of those risks of either um, volvulus or losing a lot of your small intestines uh, or a closed loop obstruction. All right, so that is it. Uh, these videos are for educational purposes only. Do not use them to diagnose or treat any disease, and we'll see you next time.